thank you everyone for joining us for our Tri-State Precision Ag webinar. My name is Stephanie Karhoff and I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator for Williams County. Tonight's webinar is a joint effort between Ohio State, Purdue, and Michigan State's Extension Systems. We'll start things off with a few housekeeping items. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and available for viewing. During each presentation, a poll will appear in your window. Please respond to each question. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. You may submit questions by using the Q&A feature on the bottom or right-hand side of your screen. With that, we will start with our first presenter, Dr. John Fulton. John is an associate professor in the Department of Food Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Ohio State. He specializes in precision agriculture, farm machinery, and digital agriculture. And tonight will help us decipher between hype and reality when it comes to ag tech. Well, good day, my name's John Fulton, and I'm just gonna kind of step through uh, some, some ideas around uh, precision ag and then kind of talk hype from reality. Uh, we don't have time to go through all topics precision ag here, but but I kind of hit some high points, especially coming out of planting season and, and kind of in the summer here. What what kind of where's value in technology, and then where are we kind of heading with a few things? So, just to kick off, I just want to kind of highlight that uh, when we look around globally, that we're really moving into this realm of digital agriculture where. Uh, implements and machines out there running are, are collecting data. They're connected to the internet. Uh, the farm offices are connected to the internet and there's a variety of software, what we call platforms today that, that growers have access to, to, to view the farm operation uh, and, and view that data and use the data that they're collecting through these machines. Uh, today, uh, we did a, here at Ohio State a, a few years ago, uh, um, survey and found that you know over 90 percent of growers and consultants carry a smartphone or something like a tablet ipad today and so people are connected uh, machines are connected though you know one of the limitations today has really been a, a full range or full coverage of rural broadband and hopefully we're dealing with that here in the u.s to, to bring internet to all areas of the country I know here in Ohio, we still have some some areas that it's very difficult to even have cellular connections. So uh, with that, that's just kind of my vision, uh, but really where reality is beginning to grow uh, today is this whole thing around digital agriculture. So today, just from a reality, I wanna talk about four quick things, four quick technologies, guidance, RTK, displays, some comments on active downpours for planters, and then where are we at with Verberate PK in line? From a value proposition, uh, guidance technology is, is kind of the uh, standard technology on machines today, whether it's tractors, sprayers, harvesters, and other machines that are being sold. We look at this John Deere tractor, it comes totally enabled today with, with auto guidance. Uh, it's not something as an option, but it's there. Uh, when we couple that with RTK, uh, I call RTK correction a very um, addictive technology. Um, the machine can uh, very accurately within an inch uh, drive itself. Uh, and uh, when we think about not only planting, but followed by post application of herbicides with sprayers and, and then ultimately going through to harvest, uh, RTK has a, a real value proposition in my book for growers. And we continue to see the adoption of RTK level guidance. But uh, for my value, for those just maybe getting in and thinking about where do I spend my money if I wanna get into precision egg technology, uh, this would be the first technology I would encourage growers would be auto guidance. And if they have the, the funds or the capabilities by a, an RTK subscription, uh, you will find it uh, very valuable to the farm operation. The other big thing, and uh, I'm a huge advocate of, is uh, having these uh, in-cab displays today. Uh, they not only can collect data, uh, as in as applied maps or coverage maps, but you know, as field operations uh, occur, in this case, the planter, 
here's a 24 row planter. I can, I can uh, look at the performance row by row, making sure that seeds are being accurately placed in the soil. But it's very valuable today to, from an operation standpoint, uh, it's basically considered an investment of inputs to have feedback and to ensure the performance of the implements, uh, machines and implements as they conduct the field operation are performing at uh, a high level. And that's from the start to beginning of, you know, whether it's planting or spraying, that we wanna make sure that we're accurately placing these products and these displays give you the capacity, especially the operator to ensure that it got done accurately, but then uh, the coverage maps to, to go back and, and look at the quality of applications. But for sure, uh, these uh, uh, to me are a very value proposition. Though some of these displays can cost anywhere from $4,000 to $7,500. Uh, it's nothing like knowing that there's an issue right away and being able to correct that issue versus covering several fields and never knowing that issue occur till you know a week or two later once either the crops up or you see damage of, of crops. So um, in cab displays are, are a good investment for the farm operation today, whether uh, regardless of size of operation. Another thing that we've done a, quite a bit of research on here at Ohio State is active downforce. And so uh, you see this planter here at the bottom left uh, actually has uh, hydraulic downforce on each individual row. Uh, and that maintains uh, a certain pressure, we'll say, uh, and is being measured as well and, and fed back to the operator. But what we have found in active downforce is these spacing on larger planters, I'm talking 16, 24, 36 row planters, um, that field conditions vary um, in terms of texture within the field, soil texture varies, uh, moisture will vary at planting. And we have found that uh, active downforce being a quick response mechanism maintains good seed to soil contact uh, and also maintains a more uniform placement in terms of depth for seeds. On the right side here is uh, some corn plants we pulled from a mechanical or a, uh, what we call the old mechanical springs that used to maintain our downforce. But you can see very quickly here that uh, from a seed to seed, that there can be due to the field operations, quite a bit of difference. Anything from something being almost two inches deep, you see this seed here being less than an inch deep place. So. When you couple that with active downforce, basically you would see, if I showed you a picture, a very uniform place seed. And I think that's very important when we wanna talk about having corn emerge or, or crops emerge uh, uniformly. So active downforce we think can pay, though it can be costly, uh, definitely pays back considering uh, the conditions our planters are being placed in in the spring today. Lastly, uh, a few comments uh, would advocate the idea around verberate, phosphorus, and potash and lime. No doubt we've shown through research that verberate lime has is, is paid for itself over the years. Um, more recently, what we've found is that uh, long-term verberate P is, is really a best management practice, especially when we consider uh, water quality issues. We want to only be able to place where we um, map or our phosphorus source out there where we need it. Uh, over time, I will tell you is not only is there an environmental benefit to verberate P and uh, K, but what we have found over uh, on average, a uh, farmer will really realize about a 7% savings in their fertilizer bill over time. Uh, that's not to say that the first time you grid or, or zone sample that you're going to have to pay some money to correct some areas, okay? So you may spend more money up front there in the first year, but over time, once you get that uh, um, uh, management level and you're just into the maintenance uh, regime, you'll find that uh, you know, on average there could be 7% savings in the fertilizer bills. So a real value proposition there when we think about P and K today as well. So what's some hype, but yet in my mind, moving to reality, automation, remote scouting, especially high, uh, high resolution scouting today that's happening. And I wanna make some comments on what we call IOT or the internet of things where we're connecting devices slash sensors to the internet. Drone spraying, um, I would tell you in, in my view is, is here in the US, 
Uh, it's been used in California for some time in high value crops, particularly uh, vineyards. But when we come back here to the Midwest or on the Eastern part of the Corn Belt, uh, we're starting to see companies uh, use drone sprayers or and have, and as a farmer, you can have access to this. Um, I know today uh, we've got two small companies operating in Ohio where you can actually hire for pay uh, then to come out and do some spot spraying or some spraying with drones. So my my point there is it's, it's here. Uh, we still have some work to do in terms of ensuring that we have good efficacy of products. But here's an example of a, a drone sprayer. You can go out and see others out there. But uh, we've been having the opportunity to work with a couple of companies. Uh, this year we're very limited uh, due to the this current conditions here in the, in, in the U.S but uh, we look forward to uh, continuing that work in 2021. But uh, drone spraying is here. Uh, my opinion on that is based on our preliminary research and, and also combining our results with others, uh, there's gonna be some real value of that, especially when we think about some of the springtime conditions. I uh, can't actually get a high clearance sprayer or a large sprayer out in the field, uh, but yet I got some pockets I need to cover just to, 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 to burn back <clears throat> some weeds you know, a drone sprayer begins to really make sense. And if I want to come in <coughs> later in the season and do some spot spraying, drone spraying begins to make sense. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing we're seeing, and this is just an example from Trianus, is um, drone scouting. And so um, <coughs> we've got some companies, as an example here in Ohio, using drones to actually go out and do stand counts in corn and beans, but also using it, um, you know, as a, as the season progresses to go out and fly and identify sec, insects, uh, disease, um, any nutrient deficiencies, etc. There's multiple companies. Again, Tranus is just an example uh, shown here. But basically, they're they're flying a drone about 50 foot with high resolution, you know, uh, fairly standard or if not a high resolution camera, um, with artificial intelligence to identify these things or to count plants. And uh, you look at companies, uh, see companies and their use of these today. We're starting to see drones become. Um, as a piece of the scouting. We're not sending a person out, but we're sending a drone. We're getting multiple uh, locations of that uh, scouted or plants counted. Uh, so I, I do think this is a growing area that we'll see more more of and, and more likely consultants delivering this type of thing as, as, as a mechanism for them to collect data and, and provide recommendations back to farmers. Lastly, just a few things on what we call Internet of Things or these devices. I talk about the Precision Planning Smart Firmer. Uh, we got soil moisture and temperature devices that are being deployed today at a very low, uh, fairly inexpensive way, and and then nutrient sensors. Here's uh, here's Precision Planning. I took this picture right from their. Uh, um, website, but this is their smart firmer, um, heavily beginning to be heavily used here in the U uh, Ohio and I think even across the U.S. for those that are precision planning uh, technology users, but uh, we're seeing, you know, four to six sensors on a lot of the planters that we've been able to work with growers on. Uh, these uh, basically with uh, NIR technology uh, run in the furrow and measure things like organic matter shown on the left. Uh, this is from a, a, a cornfield planted for one of our research projects here that you see very high resolution organic matter map from this sensor. And on the right, same field, just an example is a, a soil moisture temperature. Uh, and you can see here we were running somewhere in the 60s, um, uh, 70s in terms of soil temp uh, the day that this field was planted. Uh, my point in this is very high resolution uh, data that's starting to come in and I, I can say for those growers that are using it the ones we work with has already changed their approach to planting so it's having an impact on how they they, they approach planting and, and thoughts around doing verberate type seeding and uh, but really the the big thing is the setting depth uh, they're using this sensor to identify soil moisture 
Uh, and uh, we've even, uh, with a few cooperators that I work with, with on-farm research, have been able to adjust depths based on the sensor. So it's already having an impact for those that are using this type of technology. All connected to the internet, all able to, to visualize and get this data right out of a, an app on your smartphone or iPad. Something new uh, that's coming, uh, I use Terralytic here as an example, but nutrient sensors. So we're used to and, and have for a long time, you've seen wireless soil moisture and temperature that we can install. Today, we got a few companies that uh, have been working on and, and basically deploying uh, commercially uh, these, so these sensors that measure uh, not only moisture, temperature, and salinity, which is pretty uh, standard for soil moisture sensing, but they begin to look at phosphorus, aeration, respiration, and nitrate, uh, and even ammonia. Uh, I've seen one uh, attempting to, to evaluate and looking at those changes over time in fields. And so, you know, as, as costs are driven down, I just want to highlight that uh, placing these type of sensors out in the field may in time begin to uh, um, inform uh, things like nitrogen management in corn. Uh, be having that out in the field this just gives a different look, understanding what the soil is providing to that crop. So just be on the lookout. I encourage you to be aware of these sensors and, and maybe doing your homework on them and, and learning more about them because you're starting to see some companies offer them and sometimes they're provided free of charge. My final comments is we just want to kind of get the, the thinking here that automation, machinery automation's here. I know we're still thinking, you know, when do robotics finally hit the market and become commercialized? Uh, but Raven, who recently bought a company called Smart Ag out of Iowa and then Dot, uh, again, I encourage you to look up these companies, but uh, their AutoCop platform uh, is, is available to, to purchase this year. Uh, but the idea is I can remove a person out of the, the tractor here, pulling the grain cart, uh, basically through iPads and communication. Uh, this grain cart is communicating with the combine operator here. And uh, basically autonomously, this cart gets called to the combine, uh, gets the grain cart gets filled. Once it's filled, the combine of course, uh, unloading auger shut off and the tractor and grain cart is then uh, driven autonomously to the end of the field, wherever the uh, it's located in the in the app. Uh, someone jumps in the tractor uh, and then can unload the grain cart, puts it back in that area, dedicated area for that uh, for the system. Uh, jumps out and can drive the truck, and the grain cart then gets called back out and gets refilled all autonomously. So there's a commercial example. Uh, there's a couple others that, that you can look up uh, across the U.S. here that are being offered as well that you can actually purchase today. This is one. Just kind of looking ahead, this was presented by John Deere at Agritechnica, probably the largest farm show in the, in the world held in Germany. Just wanted to kind of highlight their autonomous tractor that they had in their display right here. Notice no cab, very small, uh, but totally autonomous. This was their autonomous sprayer that they they showcased there. Uh, that's uh, a ground sprayer. And then they also had their uh, drone sprayer uh, there. So again, just kind of thinking about what the future may look like. These are all robotic solutions, uh, and there's others besides John Deere that are showcasing this type of technology. Uh, but it seems like we're slowly moving to more autonomous type machines out there. With that, one of the bigger questions I always get is, hey, John, where do I go and, and keep up with things? Uh, just a few examples. Uh, if you haven't kept up, there's a, a website and a uh, very new called Precision Ag Reviews is kind of the idea behind where people can uh, submit their um, and rate uh, technology. So if I'm using this kind of display or that kind of this technology, people are rating that, but you can go and, and not only submit your, your rating and, and review uh, of those technologies, but you can look at what others are saying about it. In particular, if you're thinking about making a purchase, I would encourage you to go to that website and see if, it, if that technology has some reviews. The other one that's uh, got quite a bit of information is the USB Tech Toolshed. 
you can go to this uh, website. What I do call your attention to is they got a database of all the digital technologies out there. Here's an example, but you can go and look up these uh, companies, not only understand what climate field view is, but you understand what the actual technology does. Uh, so again, just kind of some background. They got videos and additional information there as well if you want to keep up with. Finally, if you want to keep up uh, with what's going on in Ohio State, we have our eFields report. Uh, this is our third edition, uh, the 2019 version, but uh, you can go to digiwag.osu.edu and uh, view the eFields report. Uh, reports on technology testing, but also some of the agronomic type things that are around site-specific management. So anyways, I'll conclude there and, um, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone here today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Hawkins, is a field specialist with Ohio State and will be sharing how on-farm research can help you get the most out of your ag tech. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Hawkins. I'm a field specialist with Ohio State University Extension and I focus primarily on precision ag and agronomic management of crops in Ohio. So today I'm excited to share with you some information about how you can use on-farm research to get the most out of ag technology that you have on your farm. To start off with, I'd like to give you guys a quick introduction to eFields in case you've never heard of it before. eFields is our on-farm research program that we coordinate here in Ohio. So we set out with three core goals. Um, the first being to help unite the pi private and public sectors to drive innovation for the benefit of farmers. And we do that by partnering with farmers to take research that is conducted at the university level and translate it into long-term on-farm profitability for farmers in Ohio and even beyond Ohio. And we want to communicate those results to you and so that third goal is to deliver the information from the on-farm research we're conducting in a timely manner and in a form that you can use to help make decisions on your farm. And we're excited that over the last three years of this program, we've really been able to broaden our impact across the state. So you can see back in 2017, we started out in 13 counties with 45 trials. And most recently in 2019, we were covering 30 counties with 88 trials. Um, 2020 is shaping up to be a great year for on-farm research, so we're really excited. I'm gonna share some uh, results that are coming here in the future from 2020, and hopefully you're as excited as I am to see that report when it comes out this, this winter. So a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about today are covered in the 2019 eFields report, and you can download that at go.osu.edu slash eFields there you can find the 2019 report as well as the past reports from 2017 and 2018. If you've got your phone handy, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you directly to the report. So to get into the core of this presentation today, I wanna to talk about how we can answer questions about technology with on-farm research. So this is just a brief list of questions that I've put together that you might be asking yourself about how you can improve your on-farm management. And this is just a very short list and incomplete. We could add many more things to it. But I see opportunities to improve our decision-making around seeding prescriptions, variable rate fertilizer applications, and many other practices by conducting on-farm research. And the reason I think that on-farm research is so um, so useful now more than ever is because we have a growing amount of data in agriculture. On your own farm, you're very likely collecting information in addition to your yield data about the different varieties or hybrids that you're planting, the chemicals that you're using for pest control. You may have access to aerial imagery. Um, and then we know that weather is one of the biggest things in Ohio, really around the world, that impacts our productivity on the farm. So how can we use these different management techniques to combat that? And I think that through on-farm research, we can take that data that we have available and apply it to better understand 
how our practices impact our bottom line. So this is an example here of just a field with some quick free data that we're able to pull down from the internet. You see that first, um, first map here is a uh, Sergo soil map that's provided for free by NRCS. Um, down here we have a topography map that we can look at the elevation across that field that can help inform us on how water moves, which we know is the big driver. And then again, weather information is freely available. So this information in combination with all of the different data layers that you're collecting on your farm can provide valuable insight to help you improve your farm management. So for the next few minutes, I'd like to walk you through some of the research that we're doing that's reported in eFields that answer two primary questions. And the first is how can we get benefit out of ag tech that we already own? And the second is going to be how can we make informed decisions about new technology that we may be considering adopting? So to start off with on getting the, the most bang for our buck out of things that we've already invested in. So we know looking back to the, the 2010s that when commodity prices were high, we had nice profit margins. Many of us were able to invest in technology on our farm and getting the most out of that might not have been at the forefront of our minds during that time period. But now that margins are tighter, you know, a lot of farmers like you are asking the questions about how can we take this ag technology that we've already invested in and increase our profitability using that technology. And so eFields I think has a lot of projects that we're conducting in partnership with farmers that help answer these questions, but I wanna specifically talk about um, one in particular today. And so I wanna talk about our seeding rate trials. It's been one of our most popular trials. We've conducted uh, trials across the state looking at both the yield response to changes in corn seeding rate as well as soybean. And so these are the results over the last three years looking at the yield response in relative yield to a target seeding rate in corn. And you can see that general yield response that we expect where at lower seeding rates, you know, there's a lot of variability in that yield and you see that diminishing return in that yield curve um, across the board. But what you see too is that a lot more of that variation in yield is driven by site specific differences in our locations. So you see lots of, lots of yield difference just within one seeding rate across the state. And so what that tells us is that there's a lot of opportunity to better inform our variable rate seeding prescriptions in a site specific manner. And the reason that I think on-farm research in particular is great for this is because we can take, in our case, we use a lot of strip trials. You can take strip trials and execute them across a field where you get, so say for example, this is a single, this is a single treatment um, of a seeding rate. And you can see how that seeding rate performs across the variability of that field. In this case, the data layer that we're looking at it here is our soil type. And we can then go through and conduct that same yield response analysis, but by different zones across the field. So in that example here, we're again looking at that, those two soil types across that field and the way that that seeding rate performs differently in those two seeding rates. And what we've seen over the last three years is that in some cases, there's not enough difference in that soil type, if this is the example we're using, to provide an economic difference in return by varying seeding rate. But in some fields like this one, you can see although the yield response curve is pretty similar between those two, um, the one here that is represented by the red squares, it increases a little more quickly and flattens off more quickly. And so if you do an economic analysis of that return to seed cost for this particular field, you're better off planning a lower seeding rate in this soil type zone than in the one um, indicated by the gray circles. And, you know, we, we really do expect this when you look at these two soil types in this case, the drainage on those two are quite different. And you can see that in the poorly drained soil, that lower seeding rate in this particular year, which was 2018, worked out better. So if you conduct analysis like this on your own farm, over multiple years, you can begin to determine whether in, in any individual field case, soil type is the correct zone or if it's something else for a data layer that you have available. 
And this can really, I think, help you make better decisions for your own farm. And I think it's incredibly important to not just look at the agronomic response, but also look at the economic response. Um, because you can see here in this example, um, you actually got more yield um, with those red squares here at 38,000. But because that yield increase between 34,000 seeds per acre and 38,000 seeds per acre was so small, it actually costs you more money to plant the higher seeding rate. So that second question I wanted to ask, this one I think is, is really the one that's more fun. We've got all these new services, tools, and technologies that are becoming available in the ag space today. And the decision of which one is going to help you make more money on your farm can be quite difficult. And I know here on the research side, we really enjoy digging in and playing with these new technologies to help inform you on what we see the most profitability being in. So some of those examples I wanna share um, here on the right, we've been playing with multi-hybrid planting here in the last few years, going back to 2015. And this one's pretty fun because you're looking at different designs in the field to show that the planter is able to execute those changes on the go with different hybrids. Um, but if you have those zones similar to what we were just talking about with seeding rate, um, you could use this technology then to very accurately place hybrids or varieties in zones of the field where they're better suited. Um, on the technology side, it works great. On the agronomic side, you're gonna want to ask for some help there to do that. Again, on-farm research is a great way to play around with some different hybrids on your farm in different zones in your field and learn quite similar to the way that we just outlined with the seeding rate trials. Um, some of the biggest areas with e-fields that we've been looking at new technologies is in improving fertilizer efficiency and specifically um, finding ways to profitably incorporate phosphorus fertilizer due to the risk of water quality issues down the line. One that's been one of my favorites over the years in addition to that multi-hybrid has been the high-speed planting. Um, this is a fun video. If you look through the 2018 report, you can find a QR code to watch it. Um, but we were able to test these high-speed planters to see how well they did placing seed at speeds ranging from five up to over 15 miles an hour. And we saw very little yield impacts at those higher speeds, which was surprising to me. Um, you would think that going that fast, placing the seed would be more difficult and you would see a yield decrease. But what we've learned is that although many of us don't have fields where you can get up to that speed in there um, due to end rows and rocks and things like that, the technology on that planter is quite capable to do, of doing what it's advertising to do. So if you feel comfortable at five and you've got a high-speed planter, you know, we feel very confident in our recommendation that you can bump that up and still get excellent seed placement. I'm quite excited about some projects that we currently have ongoing. Um, the first being we've been doing a lot of work with the Precision Planting Smart Farmers on farm. Um, if you're not familiar with these, they attach to your planter and using an optical sensor, they can estimate organic matter soil moisture, whether or not there's residue in the furrow, and also soil temperature, all on the go as you're planting the field. Um, you can see there on the left what that sensor looks like, and then on the right, this is a map um, looking at the organic matter estimate across the field. And we've been conducting research to see what kind of potential there is to use this particular technology for informing variable rate nitrogen applications. We're also looking at the capability for it to adjust depths on the go and also seeding rate um, in response to what that sensor is seeing as it drives across the field. So we're very excited to share some of those results this fall. And then another project that we're just kicking off in that nutrient management realm is looking at these real-time sensors that measure or estimate nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in the field. Um, we will be installing some of these sensors across Ohio this fall, and we're really excited to see if this has the potential to help us reduce our fertilizer use by improving our fertilizer efficiency throughout the season. So I'm gonna throw this slide up here one more time. Um, if you're interested in any of the things I've talked about or any of the other hundreds of trials that we've conducted over the last three years in Ohio, and getting some ideas for how you could use on-farm research on your own farm to improve your management, 
um, download the report and get some ideas from there. And feel free to reach out to your local extension educator or the digital ag team. We would be happy to answer any questions you have and we'd be looking forward to partnering with you in the future. So thank you for joining me today. Um, if you have any questions, I will be here later on and you can also reach me by email. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next speaker is Ricardo Costa from Michigan State University. Tonight, he will be explaining the importance and how to behind yield monitor calibration. Hello, everyone. My name is Ricardo Costa. I am a field crops educator with MS Extension, and today I'm going to be talking about yield monitor calibration. Okay. If you have questions at the end of the webinar, I'll be more than glad to answer those. Actually, if I cannot answer those questions, I'm pretty sure John Fulton or Elizabeth Hawkins, they're going to be able to do it because they know about this topic a lot as well. Actually, I even got some information from their articles. All right, just to start off, you might be asking yourself, okay, why do I care about calibrating my yield monitor? Because in the end, I'm, what I'm going to be paid is going to be based on the scale ticket and not according to my yield map. That's correct. But if you have the technology, you should make sure that it's really accurate because you can use a yield monitor to help you to compare hybrids, to compare fields, to compare when you're harvesting earlier in the harvest season or later. You can use that information to help you to create prescriptions for a fertilized application. So you want to make sure that yield monitor is calibrated. And remember one thing that garbage in is equal garbage out. So if my yield monitor is not calibrated, I can almost guarantee you're going to have wrong data. And what can you do with wrong data? Nothing. So just one quick thing here to show how a yield monitor works. We're going to have a bunch of sensors and the most important sensor in the whole yield monitor system is the impact sensor that's located in the clean grain elevator on the top in the combine. And the way that work is yield monitor does not record any yield, does not measure yield, it just estimates yield. So just have an idea, the way that sensor is going to work is whenever the grain goes up and is thrown there, that start to record that pressure from the grain and they transform that in voltage and they transform that again in grain flow rate in pounds per second. So that's our estimation. That's why it needs to be calibrated. As you can see in this picture here, when you're driving the field you're harvesting, you don't have like an equal field with like just high flow or low flow or medium or, or medium flow. It's going to vary. Some areas are going to have higher yields that are going to have higher flow, more grain coming to, uh, in your combine per, uh, per second. You're going to have areas you're going to have less grain coming in your combine and areas going to have an average amount of grain coming. So that's why it's important when you're doing the calibration of, of your yield monitor to take that in consideration. Older combines we used to do what they call two-point calibration where you calibrate that uh, low flow and high flow. But what that happened that with that calibration that you can overestimate the mass flow because it's not linear. As you can see, the mass flow is, goes up in a curved way. That's why we do what we call multi-point calibration where we want to calibrate at the high flow, low flow and average flow because we want to, to reduce the chance of error. So the question is, how can we do that? How can you do that calibration? I'm talking about basically right now, one calibration out of five or six that we do to make sure the yield monitor is working properly. But that's the main one. The way that we do the calibration of the flow rate is through either ground speed or cut width. The way that we do is simple. For ground speed, I can go, I'm going to harvest between three to 6,000 pounds of grain and I'm gonna do that at different speeds, one, two, three, four speeds for mile per hour. In that case, when I do one and four, I'm doing the low flow and the light flow and the high flow and two and three miles per hour, I'm doing it at average flow. And again, the same is valid for cut width as well. If I do full width, I'm gonna have higher flow, I'm gonna have more grain coming in the combine. If I do one quarter width, I'm gonna have less grain coming in the combine. That's how I calibrate that. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, you can ask me later through questions. I have some data here to show why it's so important to calibrate your yield monitor. Here's the calibration of your mass flow sensor. And we, can, we did that in 2016 at one, two, three, and four miles, okay? So we wanted to mimic low, medium, high flow rate. 
they like the amount of pounds that the monitor told us that we had, that we harvest. That's actually when we took that to the weight wagon, that's actually the amount in pounds that we had for each calibration. Look the difference that we had. We had up to 17% difference. So the yield monitor was underestimating our yields by 17%. So how can I use that data if I'm if I want to use that to help me to create a, a prescription if I'm getting wrong data? Again, that's why it's so important to do that calibration. When you do a calibration, you're gonna have you're gonna have to read the manual, it's deferred from which company to another one. Like I said, the new ones we can do the multi-point calibration to minimize the chance of of uh, overestimate or yields, older ones that might not will not be allowed to do, might just be able to do one or two. Now, we talk about the weight the weight uh, calibration that was the one through the master sensor, right? But there are a few other ones that I like to do it, that it's nice to do it, so it can help. Like for example, the distance cal calibration, even though you have a GPS, I like to do it, so I set up a 200 feet distance, I have a tape, and I drive the combine and I match that to make sure that the distance I see in the year, that they see uh, in the monitor is the one actually the combine draws, okay? I, we also do the moisture sensor temperature. It's pretty much the temperature. I, some pe I, I do have my own thermometer. Some people use only their cell phones. They see what's the temperature and they plug in, that, uh, in the monitor to make sure they are matching. We also do the mass flow vibration calibration. That's pretty much done by the machine itself just click a few buttons and what you need to do just to make sure is to trolling up the combine to engage the treasure and to lower the header and it's gonna take 60 seconds or nine seconds and it's gonna be done and gonna be good to go we'd also do the moisture sensor in that case you're gonna use a moisture tester or you can take the grain to the elevator pretty much you're gonna take samples of what you harvest see what the moisture tester tell you that is the percentage of the moisture and, and fix that what's showing the in your yield monitor. And again, we talk about the weight calibration that was the most important. You get four or five loads. In that case, your idea is to get different flows and you're gonna harvest, take that to your weight wagon of or to a certified scale, compare and you're gonna fix if there is any di any difference in weights, okay? And there are other calibrations that we also do lag time. It just takes around 10 to 12 seconds from when you harvest your grain until, go until pass through the, the mass flow sensor. So you need to correct that so the combine knows when I'm starting to harvest, I, I'm harvesting crop there, but to teach the sensor that even though no grain is coming, it's gonna take 12 seconds to come. So you should be recorded at that time as well. So you don't have those errors where it says that you have no yield, but literally just because it took some time to start recording. Another thing is the header position sensor is very, also important, super simple to do it. The header position settings, what tells the yield monitor to start and stop logging data points. So generally on the headlands, you raise the header, the header as you turn around and then lower it again as you re-engage the crop. If you set the operating height properly, the machine will automatically stop logging data points when you raise the header, then you start logging again when you lower it. So that will eliminate the collection of zero yield points as you turn around the end. So we're gonna avoid the mistake where I'm gonna tell you that you collect zero yield, but in reality, you pretty much just turn around. And that's gonna affect you overall yield in that field because it's gonna count that actually harvest area, but it's not. It's pretty much area you are just turning around and there is not, no yield to be collected there. That's all I have. And just as a summary, I want to tell you that calibration improves accuracy and precision. So if you want to use that data, that your yield monitor needs to be calibrated. So other thing, plan ahead. It does take some time to do the calibration and it might be a pain some, if you have to do that for corn, soybean, wheat, we understand it, but Go, that pays in the end because you want to make sure you don't have garbage data. That's all I have now. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ricardo. Our last speaker of the evening is Crystal Van Pelt from Purdue University. She will be sharing her experience with UAVs. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for this Tri-State Precision Ag event. I am Crystal Van Pelt, the Purdue Extension Educator in Steuben County. 
Uh, I'm in the very northeast corner of Indiana, and I have a couple years of experience uh, with UAVs. So tonight, I'd just like to talk about some of my experiences and some of my recommendations for those of you who are interested in using the technology or maybe um, you have the technology on your operation and are wondering if you're maximizing its potential. Um, so our opening photo here is just a little teaser. So that's our sprayer drone that we are using for um, demonstration purposes at Purdue at this point. Um, unfortunately, you have to have three different licenses to operate that. So we're still going through the licensing process ourselves, but we do take it out to field days and give spray demos using water. So it's a pretty neat feature to talk about when you're talking about unmanned aerial vehicles. So this is our team across Indiana. You can see we're pretty well spread out. So there's over 20 of us extension educators. Uh, most of us have uh, quadcopter or multi-rotor drones. Some of us have fixed wing drones with different sensors on them. Um, so if you're in Indiana, feel free to contact any of these people uh, on this map or contact myself if you have questions after this presentation. So in the winter of 2018 and 2019, I was survey surveying farmers at some of my uh, winter ag meetings and of over 300 people, 61% want to start using the UAV technology and 15% said they were already using it. Um, so because of that, I see the local need to continue uh, my work with the unmanned aerial vehicles and the drone technology. So since then, I have hosted Purdue's um, pilot program for helping people get their FAA license to be able to fly legally um, for commercial uses. So um, I don't think we have any more scheduled at this time, but I will show you a link um, in a few slides on where you can go to find out if we have these programs going on throughout Indiana. Um, and right now we're actually doing them online as well for those of you not in Indiana. So it would be the same regulations across the country since it is a federal license. So the need for UAVs really comes from the need for real-time answers. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with yield maps, but you only get that at the end of the season. So I say it's kind of like an autopsy on your field, whereas I would like to use aerial imagery uh, for real-time answers and help you guys make decisions in the middle of the season, uh, because once that crop is off the field, you can't go back and see why there is a red spot in your field. You can't check on plant health. Uh, you can guess and try to figure out what happened um, but being able to see it and be able to correct it or understand what went wrong in the middle of the season, I feel is more helpful to you folks as growers or consultants. So some of the key considerations, of course, for anything you guys adopt on your, your operations, you're worried about time, money, and your return on investment. So that's no different for drone technology and um, it, it can make a big difference as to what drone you buy for the amount of time and money you're willing to spend and what exactly you want to do with your drones. So we'll go over some of those differences. So the first big difference is whether to get a fixed wing versus a multi-rotor unmanned aerial vehicle. If you're going with drones for your aerial, aerial imagery options, um, there are airplane services that can take images for you. Um, so you can always find people to hire that way, or we'll talk about satellite imagery in a little while. Um, but with the fixed wings, it's completely autonomous. So as, as soon as you get that thing off the ground, um, there's really no control. You set the pre-planned flight mission and it flies it and comes back. And I know for the Quantix, the only way to interrupt it is to force it to crash. So that's only if you're about to crash into something. So um, that's a little, a little scary sometimes, the first few times out with that. Um, but what I have is on the right there, that's my Phantom 4 Pro in the Obsidian Edition. So I just have a standard red, green, blue camera. Um, it's worked pretty well for me. So there are a lot of sensors you can fix on drones these days. So you might be hearing of LiDAR, thermal, multispectral, hyperspectral. Um, so as I mentioned, I just have RGB, which is just the red, green, blue spectrums. Um, it's probably the same camera you'd get on a really good cell phone these days or a really good digital camera. But there are options to measure different parts of the wavelengths that your crops are reflecting. Um, so you can add the near infrared, red edge. There's all sorts of sensor options out there. 
Uh, usually you might get some sticker shock because it does cost several thousand dollars when you're adding uh, sensors onto the drone. I know for my Phantom 4 Pro, I looked into sensors and the sensor costs way more than the drone itself. So when you're looking at those options, um, you are investing quite a bit of money, but I have found if you do buy a sensor, usually the software um, to collect that data is not quite as expensive. Um, I've just been using drone deploys so that stitches together my images for me and it can do um, a very image, which kind of just changes my red, green, blue picture to a pretty plant health type map. Um, and that's worked out pretty well for me, but it's pretty costly as well. So um, I've gone back and forth about buying a sensor so I can get the cheaper software. So, I mean, it, it's really what, what you guys need on your operation. If you're into um, plant health sensing, if you're really into precision mapping, then I would absolutely say look into sensors or hiring someone who has uh, a drone with some sensor capability on it to make those plant health maps for you. But again, the different sensors are just sensing the reflectance of different colored wavelengths. So that's, that's what we're getting at when you talk about different sensors. Like the red edge is just on the edge of the visible light spectrum. Um, so just considerations for when you're purchasing a drone. Uh, so the big difference I like to talk about is the automated flights versus manual. So when you're talking about getting um, a quadcopter, they can do both. So the image on the left was actually my very first map I ever generated using my Phantom 4 Pro. And in the bottom corner there, you can see I lost radio signal and my drone lied to me saying it was done flying, but really it needed a new battery. So by the time I got back to the office and stitched this together, I realized I didn't cover the entire field. Uh, but you can see in the middle, those two strips are a sulfur trial that we were doing in 2018. And I went back a week later after they had irrigated just to see if I could still see those sulfur strips. And uh, you can see those strips right there, uh, just to the, the right side of the pivot lane there. So for me, um, I can see it in both images. So um, whether or not I needed to do an automated flight and stitch it together is probably questionable, considering I just wanted a visual um, verification of those trials. And again, the left is an automated flight I did. So I stitched together over 50 images for this field. And then I went back and did just a manual flight and snapped some manual photos myself. You can see a lot of discoloration in the field in both images. Um, so I would say if you're just crop scouting and you wanna know where the problem areas are, you can just pop that drone up in a few minutes and really see where those chlorotic uh, lesions are and get to understand your field a little better that way. Um, so this grower did not realize he had sudden death syndrome. So that's what the yellow coloration was in this field, unfortunately, and it was his first year encountering sudden death. So uh, that helps him understand to make different genetic um, uh, choices in the future and do some different um, management strategies. Then on here, uh, Lyndon Kelly, our irrigation specialist, called me out because he could not really understand why the corn was laying flat beyond the pivots. Um, you can see just in the corners there, the corn was pretty much all entirely laid down. And you can see I got some really nice imagery just to verify that yes, the corn was laying down outside of those pivots. So there is something about that extra water, which this was last year in 2019. So it's amazing that I'm saying we needed more water in 2019. Um, but as I learned, this field got hit really hard with tar spot, um, stalk rot, and um, stalk bore. So it doesn't really replace the fact that you still need boots on the ground to go see what's wrong in the field. Uh, it just shows you more where to scout and why, um, why your field's looking the way it is. And there are some livestock uses for um, for UAVs, I'm not much of a livestock person, but I did get to go fly um, this rotational grazing operation. You can tell in the middle pasture is where the cattle were just removed. And if you looked closely to the little blobs of the cattle, you can actually see exactly where they've been grazing. So this could help you figure out the timing on how to rotate your livestock and some of the damage they've done. And you can pick up on some trends across those pastures as well. 
So I did mention satellite imagery. So this is usually a pretty cheap way to get into aerial imagery to begin with. Um, so the left image is from Climate Corporations. You'll view um, app and then the person who flew this, Mark Carter, he flew with his Phantom 4 uh, drone on the right. And you can just see how much more definition Mark was able to get out of his drone um, as opposed to the satellite. So you can see different streaking patterns and you can tell more precisely where plant health is struggling in this field. So satellite imagery is a good way to kind of get an overall look. And they can actually sometimes go back in history and find um, previous year's satellite imagery. So you can have some of that historic data that we like to look, look at when making management decisions. But usually, um, if you want something more precise and you really want to see what's going on in your field, I would recommend either a drone or finding someone with an airplane service because the, the quality is just so much clearer on those services. And for more uses, I just talked about um, row crop uses, but a lot of my colleagues are finding different uses for UAVs. So if you go to extension.purdue.edu backslash UAV, you can find out some of those different uses. And we also have our training uh, program listed on there for any upcoming trainings that we have across the state. Um, so I talked a little bit about the FAA license. So anyone flying for commercial use, even on your own property, is required to have the FAA Part 107 UAV license. Um, and I know they can't really track this very well right now, but they are talking about legislation to put different tracking devices on drones. Um, so um, as they possibly realize that technology, it might be a little harder to escape the long arm of the law. So this uh, just kind of shows the different class airspaces and there's a little drone um, image to show you different areas where you're allowed to fly that drone. But especially if you're in larger metropolitan areas, you're really gonna wanna understand your class airspace. Um, and even for smaller areas, I know have, I have um, different seaplane landing areas here in Steuben County. We have a small airport um, and the software can usually tell you about uh, small um, landing strips. So if there's a crop duster in your neighborhood, usually my software um, will pick up on that and tell me, hey, watch out, you're within a couple miles of this place. So um, it's just good to understand what your risks are in the air. Um, so it is a busy space. So I have <clears throat> what we call our sectional map here on the right. So this is the Angola area up in the, the top section. So that's what I'm primarily concerned with, but I do go down to Fort Wayne sometimes and that looks like it gets a lot busier. And there's also airport heli or helipads for hospitals. So I have to make sure I'm not interfering with any critical missions such as the life lights, crop dusting, and all these little blue lines are different military training routes. So that's also something to be aware of is the sky is just a very busy place. Um, and the license is pretty helpful. There is a lot on the initial test that is very overwhelming and seems like you don't need to know it as a drone operator, but the FAA wants to make sure you're as safe as possible when using this technology, and I cannot blame them for that. So with that, if there are any questions, um, feel free to type those in the chat, or if we're able to unmute, um, feel free to ask those. <clears throat> All right, so John, do you want to start answering some of the questions in the chat box? Um, it looks like our first question um, is asking about how many acres does one person need to, um, to farm in order to purchase guidance equipment? Yeah, you bet. Steve, that's a good question. Uh, there used to be a couple what I consider really nice calculators that uh, you could use to evaluate guidance like section control and I think even variable rate at one time was one um, but uh, those seem to be uh, hard to find these days on the internet one of them was a uh, called Trimble Ag GPS R ROI calculator um, I have not used it or tried to find it in some time, but that was based off work out of uh, Kansas State several years ago out of the Ag Econ Department. Uh, that was a really good one. 
that we used to actually use in class and, and could actually evaluate and give you an answer, kind of uh, estimated savings and then the payback acres. Uh, I'll put in the um, in there too, uh, recently Agco Fuse has like a calculator that, uh, uh, that you can check out. And I think there's a couple other ones out there, but they may not be guidance oriented, They're more auto section control or section control oriented. Uh, from my past uh, research, and, and maybe this isn't getting to the core of your question, but uh, you know we we've always used 10% savings uh, or reduction and uh, overlap when we compare manual or foam kind of spraying type things to uh, GPS GNSS type guidance. Um, one thing I would note today. Uh, if you're trading to newer equipment or purchasing a newer equipment, most of, most of those machines already have guidance embedded into them. And in several cases, it's just a matter of, do I want to pay for upgrading to a higher end correction service such as RTK? And that could cost you anywhere from uh, $1,200 to I think $2,500 recently that I've been involved with. But uh, I'll type some things in the chat as well to that question. But uh, they're hard to find those ROI calculators anymore uh, out there. And then our second question is also for John. What level of accuracy can field sensors measure available nutrient levels? And how is that data available to the grower? Yeah, Jake, you, uh, a good question and, and one I think that we're really trying to to have a good answer to. I, I don't have a, a great answer for you tonight, uh, but preliminarily uh, having access to some of the, the, the couple different types of sensors. Uh, when it gets to soil moisture and temperature, I feel pretty confident that uh, we're going to get accurate measurements, but when we get to that nutrients uh, and things like resp respiration, um, you know, they definitely can track changes over the growing season, and that's really an eye-opening uh, piece, uh, for me at least, how much that can change over the time. But in terms of accuracy, um, you know, I think we're still kind of working through that. What I can tell you, at least from uh, experiences from a nutrient sensor, we're probably going to stick a lot more sensors out in the field than we would typically for like a, a basic soil moisture temperature type sensor. Uh, and that really has to deal with uh, addressing errors and improving accuracy and, and really gets to the calibration of these sensors. So you stick a lot of them out there and, and you can do some, some, um, some methods to, to really improve the accuracy. Uh, but I do think and that we'll be able to, to track variation of nutrients over time. Uh, there's still work to be done on these sensors. I will say that, uh, but relatively, I think when you begin to understand that uh, how much things could change relatively, that we might uh, be start to inform some of our our decisions in season, uh, in particular around fertility. So, I'll type some of my comments in there real quick, and and uh, of course come back with me with more questions, but. Uh, as Elizabeth alluded to, I, I think we'll be able to share more and, and be a better to, uh, equipped to answer that question uh, come next year. Thanks, John. Our next question is for Elizabeth. So in your yield response analysis, how do you deal with high standard deviations within treatments due to yield mapping errors? And what is the best statistical test to compare mean differences between treatments? So those are two great questions, um, especially the first one. We know when we're conducting field scale research, um, field variability is gonna be an issue that we have to contend with as well as um, that yield data collected via a combine can be quite noisy and it has inherent errors that we need to deal with. So to help manage that on the front end, um, the first thing we do is we make sure that the treatment areas within the field are large enough that that machine can get up to a steady state of operation to get that flow rate through the combine to be pretty steady when we know that we're gonna get the most reliable yield estimates. Um, the second thing is after the fact, we also clean that yield data 
can we go through and make sure we take out any of those common errors that you typically would find in the yield data prior to conducting the analysis. Um, this, the next thing we do there on the front end is when we set up these trials, the majority of the trials that we conduct are laid out as an RCBD or a randomized complete block design. And so since these trials are both, the treatments are randomized and replicated in the field, that helps us manage that field variability as well. So part two uh, of that question, which was what is the best statistical test to run? So that's gonna really depend on what experimental design you start with in the field. Um, like I said a, a moment ago, we do um, design most of our trials in the eFields program as RCBDs. So we use an ANOVA, an analysis of variance analysis, and then an LSD, least significant difference, to determine whether the yield differences are statistically significant. So to simply explain that, um, if the yield differences between the treatments are larger than the error, which would be the differences in yield between replications of the same treatment, then we can say that the yield difference that we observe is likely due to the treatment and not field variability or any other error that we were dealing with. Thanks, Elizabeth. Our next question um, may be best for Ricardo to answer. What are the software alternatives for processing and cleaning harvest maps? All right, so, and, uh, and actually, if, if John and Elizabeth wanna join me here, uh, I personally use SMS, but if you have a Farmer Pro or Farmer Fit from Trimble, you can use that to help you to clean your data as well. Uh, you also can use, there is a, actually a free one from USDA that's called Yield Editor. And I'm gonna type the link here that you can go and download that one. I, I actually never used that. So John, I don't know if you, if you have used that, that free one from USDA, but you have a few options besides SMS. Um, yeah, there's I agree with the SMS, the Trimble products, and there's a couple of other software that you can set up some of your baseline, um, removing errors from yield data. Uh, I, I, I advocate for that, uh, but understand uh, anytime that you're removing data, I, I clearly want to understand why we're removing it as well. I just don't want to remove data just because it seems high or low. Uh, but to understand why there's an error potentially in that data is important in my book. Uh, the USDA is uh, um, can be used, uh, can be tedious, uh, especially at uh, the start, uh, but it can do some spatial correction, uh, including uh, delay time corrections, but uh, a very sensitive and means of cleaning data and one that I would want someone to be clearly understanding what they're doing when they use that tool so but uh, um, it, it can be used pro if, if if you understand it and used properly you can you can help uh, in some cases improve improve the quality of yield yeah that's a great answer just to kind of tack on to that my personal preference is to use a software like ag leader sms to convert that file from a proprietary yield file into a generic shape file and then you can take that into any GIS software, um, whether it's one that you're, you've got a subscription to or one that's free. And you're able to look at the different attributes of that, of that data. Like John said, just throwing out data because it's high or low is a dangerous game. If you can look at other attributes, like the speed, the travel speed of the combine, you can begin to understand what areas of the field are you likely to have errors due to sudden stops or changes in speed across the field. Thanks everyone. We have another question for John. What is the speed of sensor and system response? Is it fast enough to do actual rate changes at normal field speeds? Can the e-control system of the equipment react that quickly? Tom, you know, we've, uh, we've greatly advanced in this area. Um, if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, you know, we would be talking sometimes in the three second to five second range in terms of adjustment. Um, today, uh, most, most of our uh, planting equipment and application equipment are using uh, PWM or pulse width modulation valves. 
Uh, we've got data on that. And what I would tell you, as long as you got your look ahead set, um, they respond fairly quickly, um, mostly well under a second you can make some of the rate changes, even a broad rate train change. Say you're going from uh, 100 pounds per acre of fertilizer to, to 400 pounds an acre of fertilizer. Uh, those valves, those PWM valves today, the newer ones uh, can respond within, you know, two tenths, three, three tenths of a second. So we're doing better. I'm not saying I'm, I'm adjusting exactly on the line, but if we got our look ahead set properly, our valve adjusted properly, there's some adjustments on those valves to make them work. But in terms of response time, they are very quick today. Thanks, John. We also had a general question if there had been any studies with international harvester planters. I can not, jump in, okay. Stephanie, if you want me to. Parker, I'm glad you could uh, join us tonight. Um, hope uh, things are going well for you down there. Um, we, you know, if you look at some of the e-fields reports, uh, if you're talking international, we, we've been doing uh, work with CNH for several years, including uh, some of the planter technology or, or CNH planters coupled with precision planning technologies and some other companies that we've been working with. So uh, yes, we have been doing work in that area for at least five years that I've been here. Uh, I can share that if there's a very specific type of question you have, uh, but um, we have had the opportunity just uh, and then my time here to work with CNH slash international and John Deere, um, planners and some of the work that we've been doing. Thanks, John. In the chat box, we also had a question for Crystal on what the time frame was to stitch her images together into a field composite. So I'm not sure, Crystal, if you just wanted to give a quick recap on that answer, that way all the attendees can get that answer. Uh, yeah, so typically I say it, um, with the software I use, which um, is currently drone deploy, it takes about 10 minutes to uh, map out the field. And with my Phantom, it usually takes 15 to 30 minutes to fly like a 50 to 150 acre field. Um, and then uploading and processing time uh, varies a lot depending on your internet connection. So in town in Angola, I usually have decent internet speeds, um, but still it could take one to three hours just to get um, that stitched image process. Um, so the services that John was talking about, um, well, it wasn't Centera, well, I forget the company name John mentioned, um, but they'll usually tell you 24 to 48 hours to get you um, their information back. So when they're talking about um, identifying those specific lesions and in those insects, um, they usually tell you 24 to 48 hours to get imagery back from them. Thanks, Crystal. So that is it for our questions. Um, if you have any, put them in the Q&A box now. If not, I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing their expertise with us tonight. And thank you all for joining us and best of luck with the rest of your growing season.